From ABC7 New York, this is Eyewitness News Extra Time. This, this is not like what you would expect as someone who is, you know, expecting to, you know, go home, be with their families, leave work, come back and forth to work. Breaking right now, power problems and a large brush fire ground New Jersey Transit and Amtrak service on the Northeast Corridor to a halt again, leaving passengers hot and bothered. Also breaking, a deadly school bus accident. A kindergartner and his mother struck and killed while walking to school. And on a much lighter note, a young boy graduates from the sixth grade after surviving a heart transplant and a stroke. Tonight, you'll hear from the doctor who helped make that happen. And good evening and welcome to this edition of Eyewitness News Extra Time. I'm Shade Betterinois, and we begin with breaking news. On this very steamy start to summer, many New Jersey transit customers are fuming as they try to get home. Long lines are filling Penn Station in Manhattan because train service between there and Newark was suspended for several hours. New Jersey Transit says it is finally in the process of restoring service. Eyewitness News reporter Jim Dolan is live at Penn Station with more. Jim? Today, Amtrak's train started to move a short while ago. New Jersey Transit trains starting to move, but what a week it has been for New Jersey Transit. The same folks stuck here today. We're stuck here for hours. Also, on Tuesday, Penn Station is a transit hub, but you sure could understand why folks feel like they have moved in this week. As Amtrak commuters settled in for a long summer afternoon, the big board didn't offer much hope in Penn Station. Amtrak's Northeast Corridor was effectively shut down from Philadelphia to New Haven, Connecticut. But passengers here will have plenty of company. The whole week in the morning and in the afternoon, every week I'm commuting from Montclair, New Jersey to here, and it's, it's very annoying. They're making announcements, but I really can't hear because of all the noise and the commotion that's going on. There's so many people here. A lot of people, and it's very hot. The New Jersey transit waiting area was packed and, yes, hot and going nowhere anytime soon. And this was getting old. The same problem caused massive delays on Tuesday, and commuters were not loving this. It's like the third time in three weeks, four weeks, you know, so it's getting too frequent. This I was going to ask, it seems to be happening more, right? Yes, yes, it's been happening very frequently. Who knows, four hours? From that point, so now I heard about two more hours. So what do you do? I would debate and go to the path and take that to Newark or go to grab the bus, but I'm afraid to leave here and end up in a worse situation I'm in now. Today could be three hours by the time we figure this out. I have nothing that I can do. So it has been a day, you know, we talked about Amtrak and we have cell phone video from a woman who was stuck on a New York bound train from Washington early this afternoon. Her train stalled when the power went out, obviously. She was transferred, had to walk the plank to another train, a diesel train, which took her to Newark Penn Station, where she has been stuck for two hours in the heat there. It has been a day for New Jersey transit commuters and for Amtrak commuters as well. And for most of those folks, it is a long way from over. Reporting live from Penn Station, Jim Dolan, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Yeah, Jim, this is a long, a long day indeed. But now you've, the service has resumed, but there's still residual delays, so people are still not out of the woods. I mean, this could go on for several more hours. What are they saying to you? Shade, take a look back here. Could you go into the uh, into the board there? You see, it, it still looks like it has most of the day. Stand by, delayed. One train is boarding. You see the folks moving down there. They are going to a train, and, and that is how it has been all day long. Either canceled trains completely or delayed trains. Obviously, it's going to take hours to catch up and get everybody on board a train who wants to get on board. And of course, some folks left and just took the bus. Jim Dillon, thank you. And it was funny to see those people running. They said, I do not want to miss this last train. Okay, Jim, thank That's you. Exactly right. Yep. Well, it is extremely crowded at Newark Penn Station as well, both inside the station and outside. There is a massive traffic jam right outside the station as people line up to pick up passengers. Commuters are fed up with the second mass transit nightmare commute in just a week. Oh, I'm coming from New Jersey, headed to uh, Connecticut. I do basketball work. And uh, next thing you know, the train just stopped. And uh, I don't understand why. I speak with the guy, and he says, 
is a lack of communication even on their part. He can't even tell us anything. It's pretty frustrating. Um, it's taken me now an hour and a half to do something that usually takes me about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Adding to the commuter chaos was this, a large brush fire near the New Jersey transit tracks in Secaucus this afternoon. It forced some crews that could have been working on the overhead wire outage to monitor those tracks instead for any fire damage. The fire broke out late this afternoon in the brush between the tracks and the New Jersey turnpike just north of Secaucus Junction. For the most part, the fire is now under control. And we are also following breaking news in Westchester County. A kindergarten student and his mother walking to an elementary school in Maranek this morning were killed after being hit by a school bus. The bus had students on board. Eyewitness News reporter Stefan Kim has a story from Maranek. Esto sí me afecta mucho a mí y a la comunidad entera. Parents at Mamaroneck Avenue Elementary School are feeling anguish today after a six-year-old boy and his 43-year-old mother were struck and killed this morning by this school bus. Investigators say the school bus had the green light as it was making a turn, while pedestrians had the walk sign. As the bus was turning, there were several adults and children in the crosswalk, crossing with the crosswalk sign. The driver of the school bus is currently cooperating with investigators and it appears at this time that it was a tragic accident. Police say the child, a kindergartner, is from the Mamaroneck Avenue School. The bus was on the way there with students and an aide on board. No one on the bus was physically injured, but they are shaken from the horror they witnessed. The boy was pronounced dead at the scene at Mamaroneck Avenue and New Street around 8.20 this morning. It's still unclear why the bus driver did not yield to pedestrians, but parents say for years they've been asking for a crossing guard here. Everybody speeds. They go through the red lights. It's crazy. It's sad. Meanwhile, at a time when the school should be celebrating kindergarten graduation right around the corner, instead, a community tonight is in mourning. Our plan tomorrow morning is to open with uh, fully staffed with providers who can support students. Um, and our plan is to band together, wrap around services for the family and ensure that everyone feels supported. Um, and that that's that's what a community does. And that's our intent. Investigators did draw a blood sample as is standard practice from the 68 year old bus driver from Royal Coach Lines. Again, he is fully cooperating with the investigation. No charges pending at this time. In Mamaroneck, Stefan Kim, Channel 7. Eyewitness News. Now to our hot streak. The mercury hit 90 degrees in Central Park today to mark the first official day of summer. The last time it was that high was back in September. Here's Chief Meteorologist Lee Goldberg. Lee? All right, thank you, Sade. And we are far from over with this hot stretch. It is here to stay. Summer arrived just before 5 o'clock this evening. It's off to a sizzling start. The summer solstice was the earliest in over 200 years. Got a long summer ahead. Hopefully it's not as extreme in terms of the heat as we have now. Day four of the heat wave inland today and our first 90 degree day in New York City as Sade said now even hotter tomorrow feeling like 95 to 100 plus and storms will be a little bit more widespread. I mean we're not talking widespread severe outbreak but I think scattered storms can get closer to the coastline tomorrow. It remains steamy through Monday. The humidity takes a break on Tuesday but the heat really doesn't. Today's high in the park was 91. That's the first since September 8th first 90 degree day. The average first occurrence of 90 degrees is late May. So we're late, but we're making up for lost time. The average high 81. Lots of sailboats out on the East River this afternoon. That's the place to be on the water for the foreseeable future. 86 right now. A south wind at 14 knocked us down from the 91, but it's very humid outside. Southwest wind boaters tomorrow. A little choppy and the rip current risk will be on the moderate side. The air quality will remain poor, unhealthy for sensitive groups. There's very thick and heavy 91 degrees out there. For our high temperature today, sunset tonight, 831 and sunrise tomorrow at 525. By the way, we have the full strawberry moon coming up tomorrow to start summer. So low 90s along the I-84 corridor, a little better off the sound in Bridgeport, but inland Danbury going at 91 now. Great in the South Shore, Long Island, upper 70s and lower 80s, 84 Belmar and 90 in Andover, New Jersey. The heat index is in the mid 90s. If you notice, the highest readings have been north and west so far this week. What's going to happen is we'll have a front coming in, and I think the highest feel like readings tomorrow afternoon will actually be more city, west, and south. I mean, it'll still feel like lower to mid 90s inland, but we could have some feel like readings close to 100 across interior parts of New Jersey, an excessive heat watch there as we go into the weekend. Right now, thunderstorm free, but a line of showers along I-88 continues to drift south. There still could be a little pulse up of an isolated shower in a Sullivan, Ulster and Dutchess in the evening hours, but thankfully the severe weather has stayed north. If you watch the future cast, 
Those any showers would fizzle out quickly this evening. We start out warm and sticky tomorrow and notice how scattered storms around could even get down to the coast tomorrow afternoon. We should get in the low to mid 90s in New York City. Again, our hottest weather is probably south and west. A few scattered storms off to the north and west. Initially, they'll form along a sea breeze front after about 3 o'clock. But once we get to maybe 5 o'clock, there are more numerous storms over the Hudson Valley, Catskills, and Poconos. Same drill on Saturday. While it's still hot and humid, there are a few fronts around the area. So I think we will have some scattered storms forming. So if Saturday is your outdoor or beach day, just keep an eye to the sky during the afternoon hours for a drenching downpour. By Sunday, with a front well to the north, I don't think this is as much of a trigger for a shower or storm, so most of that day will just be hot, steamy, but dry. An evening thunderstorm well north, otherwise clear to partly cloudy for tomorrow up to 94. Feels like 95 to 100. An afternoon storm, and I'll say especially north and west, but I do think one or two of those could sneak into New York City and maybe down to the beaches. 74 degrees tomorrow night, an evening storm, then warm and stuffy. Here's your seven day accurate of the forecast. So an alert tomorrow for peak heat, but it doesn't get much better over the weekend. Storms are scattered in the afternoon on Saturday. Isolated on Sunday, probably a sunnier day at 92. Some storms could get strong on Monday as lower humidity finally comes in for one day, but it's still coupled with upper 80s. By Wednesday, the humidity is coming back in Sade. About a week from now, Thursday night and maybe Friday or Saturday of next week is when we get a couple days where it's more refreshing after okay. this hot stretch. We'll need it by then. Back yes, to you. we will. Okay, thank you, Lee. Okay. And as we continue with Eyewitness News Extra Time, a young boy's remarkable recovery. How he survived a heart transplant and a stroke to graduate from the sixth grade. Next. A remarkable recovery for a 12 year old boy in Westchester County who struggles with medical challenges. Brandon Pineda has spent the last eight months recovering from a heart transplant and a stroke. He will finish the sixth grade this month and will be ready to return to his community school. Brandon currently attends Mount Pleasant Blythdale School, where he has a medical oversight team while also receiving comprehensive therapies daily and returning home at night. Blythdale Children's Hospital is the only hospital in New York State with its own public school district on site. And joining us now with more is Dr. Devia Lakhani from Blythdale Children's Hospital. And Dr. Lakhani, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, how is Brandon doing right now? Oh, Brandon's doing remarkably. We're really excited that he's graduating and will be going back to his community school soon. Well, he, you know, he's had quite a medical journey. We were talking about a heart transplant and a stroke. Can you talk about some of the challenges he faced during his recovery? For sure. You know, Brendan's had a really challenging, challenging childhood altogether. He was born with something called heterotaxy, where his organs are malpositioned. And in particular, his heart had multiple congenital congenital abnormalities and required multiple, multiple surgeries before his transplant. Unfortunately, he had a stroke after one of those procedures um, and his heart failed. And luckily, he was able to get a transplant last year and has been doing really remarkably since then. Oh, that is so good to hear. He's got to be a strong kid. You, know, I, I think one thing that is just so fascinating, it's quite incredible that your hospital has its own public school district. That just doesn't happen. First of all, how did that come about? You know, the Blythdale Children's Hospital has had this public school on site for many, many years, and it's really evolved over time. You know, we're seeing children like Brandon, who have a lot of chronic medical conditions, who struggle with places to go, whether it's after a procedure like this or just because of their chronic medical needs. And this program has really been able to fill the gap for many of those patients. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit more about, you know, when it comes to Brandon talking about that inter integration of medical care and educational support, it, it, I'm sure it must have helped him in his recovery, right? Oh, most definitely. You know, for a child like Brandon who receives a heart transplant, patients like that are immunocompromised, right? And so they really shouldn't be in large settings where they're exposed to lots of viruses. So under any other circumstance, Brandon would have been home after his transplant, receiving homeschooling and whatever therapies could get in his home. We were really lucky that we were able to advocate for Brandon to come here where he can be in school, be around his peers and receive therapies and receive his medical care. It's really it's really remarkable. Yeah, it's so great because your mind actually gets off the recovery and you're thinking about school and it allows you to just stay focused on on education and staying really on track despite everything that you're going through. So exactly. Right. Go ahead, please, doctor. Oh, I was going to say that, you know, Brandon has done so well and he's able to graduate this year, which is wouldn't have happened in any other circumstance. 
So how does the hospital's feature of having its own school, public school district on site benefit children like Brandon who are undergoing just these intensive medical treatments? You know, for someone like Brandon, I think what was particularly helpful is that we were able to really liaise with his cardiac team at his hospital. Mm -hmm. And so as they were making changes, we were able to make the changes while he was here in program and monitor him. So things like his blood pressure, um, his uh, any symptoms he was having, we were able to like relate that in real time to his, his team um, at his other hospital, which I think doesn't happen in any other program or community school that I know of. And on top of that, he was able to get really intensive therapies, which really has helped with his deconditioning and is allowing him to go back to his community school where he can function just like every other child. Yeah, which is so important. And, and lastly, doctor, do you have any uh, advice or insights to other parents whose children are going through, you know, serious medical conditions like this as Brandon? You know, what I would say is that children are resilient. I see it every single day, and Brandon is no exception to that. I think they're really, they're fighters, and, you know, with the right services in place, they can really do anything, as we've seen today with Brandon. And so I think just keep at it and, and remember that they are much stronger than we think they are. Yes, they are. Okay, well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us, and it was great to hear about Brandon, and I love what you guys are doing at the hospital, helping uh, kids in so many ways, not just medically, but educationally. Thank you again. Thank you. And as we continue with Eyewitness News Extra Time, the loss of a legend, we look back on the amazing life and career of actor Donald Sutherland. He played villains and heroes, romantic leads and mysterious sidekicks. Donald Sutherland could do it all on the big screen. This afternoon, we learned the Canadian actor whose career spanned six decades died after battling a long illness. I would just use reporter Joel Gargiulo looks back on his life and legacy. I'm not joking. This is my job. To one generation, Donald Sutherland is known as the beloved actor from films like The Dirty Dozen and MASH, breakout roles for him. I'd rather be a civilian, sir. To another, he's President Snow from the Hunger Games franchise. I have a problem, Miss Everdeen. A beloved presence on the big and small screen, his career spanned more than six decades. His performances in films like Ordinary People, Don't Look Now, and Without Limits are considered some of the finest of their respective decades. You face the best middle distance runners in any games I can recall. Sutherland received an honorary Oscar in 2017 for his significant contributions to cinema. I wish I could say thank you to all of the characters that I've played. He won an Emmy for his role in Citizen X, as well as a pair of Golden Globes. He is survived by his wife, Francine, five children, including actor Kiefer Sutherland, and four grandchildren. Kiefer announcing the news on social media, saying this about his dad. With a heavy heart, I tell you that my father, Donald Sutherland, has passed away. I personally think one of the most important actors in the history of film, never daunted by a role good, bad, or ugly. He loved what he did and did what he loved, and one can never ask for more than that, a life well lived. Donald Sutherland leaves behind a legacy of unforgettable performances that will continue to inspire and entertain for generations to come. Hope, it is the only thing stronger than fear. Donald Sutherland was 88 years old. Tributes to the actor have been pouring in. Helen Mirren saying Donald Sutherland was one of the smartest actors I ever worked with. Ron Howard adding, I was blessed to direct him in Backdraft. He was one of the most intelligent, interesting film actors of all time. I'll send it back to you. What a legend. And as we continue with Eyewitness News Extra Time, the new law in Louisiana making it mandatory to post the Ten Commandments in all public classrooms, sparking intense debate tonight. And Governor Hochul makes it official, a crackdown on social media is on. A new flashpoint in the separation between church and state. Schools in Louisiana will now be the first in the country to be required to display the Ten Commandments. As ABC's Christian Cordero shows us, the new law is sparking debate on both sides of the political aisle. There's a new law in Louisiana elevating what proponents call the original set of laws. This bill mandates the display of the Ten Commandments in every classroom in public, elementary, secondary, and post-education schools in the state of Louisiana. 
Louisiana now requires the Ten Commandments be displayed on a poster in easily readable font and with a four paragraph context statement describing how the Ten Commandments were a prominent part of American public education for almost three centuries, according to the legislation drafted by the state's GOP. It was no guesswork. We knew we got it to him. He would sign it. If you want to respect the rule of law, you got to start from the original lawgiver, which was Moses. It's expected to be challenged in court, with some, like a major teachers union, arguing the law is unconstitutional, lacking respect for the separation of church and state. Our schools uh, are places where we welcome all students from all races, from all places, who practice religion, different religions, or none at all. And this law flies in the face of that basic foundation of the democracy in this country. The Ten Commandments, inherent to both Judaism and Christianity, is an ethics code that condemns murder and stealing and starts with, you shall have no other gods before me. We have many strategies to talk about morals. Those strategies are not steeped in religious beliefs. Previous efforts to require the Ten Commandments to be displayed in public schools have been shut down by the Supreme Court. Legislators hope this time will be different, considering the court's conservative majority. In Washington, Christiane Cordero, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. New York State is officially cracking down on social media companies to protect children. Today, Governor Hochul signed two pioneering bills. One restricts children from being exposed to addictive feeds, leading to something called the doom scroll. The other protects a child's personal data from being shared or sold. The governor says she is trying to combat teen suicides in isolation. They are taken to a place in their own bedrooms that grew darker and darker because it pulled them in to a place where they could not escape from. The new laws come at a time when New York City and the state are considering a ban on smartphones in the classroom. A New Jersey firefighter is being called a hero after saving a wrong way driver trapped in his burning truck. It was last September when the Cherry Hill Fire Ladder 24B platoon was on their way to training when they witnessed a box truck had slammed into the side of a building. First responders worked to evacuate the building while others worked to extricate the driver. Within seconds, the truck was engulfed in smoke. Freshman firefighter Jack Borelli leapt into action without wearing any protective gear. To be honest, I think the adrenaline, we all just wanted to get the guy out. So it wasn't really a thought, I don't think, for any of the firefighters that were operating to like leave and go grab a mask. Borelli, alongside members of his ladder company, received an award for going above and beyond the call of duty. And finally tonight, a parrot with a potty mouth is going viral after a Facebook post about it was shared by an animal shelter in upstate New York. This is Pepper, an Amazon parrot who was recently dropped off at an SPCA center in Niagara when its owner moved out of state. Before this, Pepper lived in a home with a small dog that was very disobedient. Since Pepper often imitates what he hears, he picked up some profanity from the owner. Now the foul-mouthed bird is having trouble finding a new home. You know, if you've got, you know, children in, in the home and you've got visitors that come over, um, the chances are Pepper is, is going to be a little offensive. The Niagara SPCA says it's received more than 300 applications for people wanting to adopt Pepper since his Facebook post went viral. And that's it for us. I'm Shade Betterinois. Have a good night.